when I had to sit down and make phone calls and like send apology messages to people that were freaking out thinking I was dead was the shittiest moment of my life. Welcome to Self Made and Sober. I'm your host, Andrew Lasis with selfmade-coaching.com. And in this podcast, it's my job to interview people who are not only crushing it in business, but have also struggled with addiction in the past and are in long-term recovery. Be sure to join our Facebook group where we help entrepreneurs grow and scale their business at facebook.com slash groups slash SMC Mastermind, like Self-Made Coaching Mastermind. I hope you enjoy the show and be sure to subscribe and rate the show afterwards so you can get notified each Friday when we put out a new episode. Welcome to the Self-Made and Sober Podcast. I'm your host, Andrew Lasis, and with me today is Sarah Ordo. She's an entrepreneur, makeup artist, self-published author, podcast host, YouTuber, mindset coach, dog mom, carb enthusiast, and she is sober as fuck. Yes, I am. (laughs) She is all of those things and then some. So the burning question that I've had since this interview was, was booked, what makes somebody sober as fuck? Honestly, in my world, it's being sober relentlessly, like no apologies and doing it the way you have to do it to stay sober and healthy and happy. So no apologies. Is that like you're just going to follow your own path and do what works for you? What exactly is the no apologies sobriety look like? For me, it looked like definitely doing it my own way. Um, I had a lot of people weigh in with a lot of opinions of what I should have been doing. And I've always been kind of like a stubborn, like hard-headed girl. So I knew I always had to figure it out on my own. And I I wasn't going to listen to what everybody else was telling me. You know, a lot of people suggested I go through the 12 steps, do things like that. And I actually never did. I found alternative ways through my sobriety and just kind of did it how it would work best for me because I know it's definitely not a one size fits all type thing. Yeah. And a lot of people like to shove that one size fits all, but it's kind of different strokes for different folks. So what are kind of the strategies that you use in your sobriety? I dove into a lot of like self work. Like I realized I had to And I'm sure you can relate, like you need to heal the shit within you of why you were drinking sometimes more than the actual like action itself almost, because if you don't fix the the root problem, you're just taking away the actual physical act of doing it. And you're always still going to have those triggers, those emotional and mental things that are going to drive you to want to do it again. So for me, it was a ton of self-work. I read a ton of books you know, really got comfortable being alone, being by myself and not being dependent on something or someone else. And my biggest help though, was I started going to therapy weekly and I still go and I'm almost five years sober and I literally still go to therapy every single week. And I think that was the most effective thing in my journey because it did really help me dig deep and figure out those reasons that I didn't understand that drove me to drink for so long. Yeah, there's a lot of self-discovery and getting the awareness. You know, we kind of are just creatures of habit and it's just like, well, something goes wrong and I know if I drink that it's better. So, and then something bad happened because I was drinking, but if I drink again, then that'll solve that problem. But then, and you know, we just kind of, we get used to it and that just becomes kind of our baseline. And until you have like a third party kind of weigh in, like, have you noticed this trend in your life? And it's like, yeah, but you don't really know me. My situation's different. Right. And then it's like, okay, but I'm going to ask it again. Like, have you noticed this trend? And it's like, well, I suppose that is a trend. And, you know, that self-discovery, like, that's not just a, well, you paid this person and they just asked you to talk about your problems. Like, there's right. a lot of value in it, especially if you find someone that you can connect with and know and trust and they can help you uncover a whole lot of these things. And that's been my, um, my experience as well, where it's like I go into every situation just thinking I know everything. Mm-hmm. And then it kind of shuts me <laughs> off from being receptive and open-minded to solutions to my problems because I've kind of got that like, 
I'll go my own way. I'll find my own journey. I know this wheel already exists, but my ego tells me that I can make a better wheel and it's going to be faster and it's going to be so much better than all of the other wheels that exist. And it's like, take a step back and, and just accept things for how they are. But yeah, getting that insight and awareness, being self-published author, what does your journey look like through doing that? Was that something that was always in the cards for you? Or is that like a new discovery in sobriety? That was never in the cards for me at all. I actually started, I was a preschool teacher. I went to school, I have an early childhood degree, and then I actually went to cosmetology school and was working in the beauty industry as well, and I had never written anything longer than a college paper, like ever, and that was stressful to me, like that was a lot. So I really started out, like right after I got sober, I was looking for something to do, I think, just to like let something out and express myself and kind of something therapeutic. And I already had a YouTube channel because I wanted to be like a beauty blogger, like every girl did back in the day. And one day I just sat down with my cell phone and I filmed like a 30 minute video and called it my sober story, why I stopped drinking. And I was 30 days sober. And I just kind of like naively sat there and like rambled on about how I was just going to stop drinking. And this is why, and this is okay. Like, here we go. Just kind of talking about it. And all of a sudden the video like took off and people started commenting on it and emailing me and being like, Oh my God, like I had such a similar experience to you. So I had this, this community of people showing up all of a sudden that had a similar experience. And I just started filming a YouTube video at like every one of my milestones. So I filmed one at like three months, six months, nine months, a year. And then I started doing them like yearly after that. And people just kept finding these videos and contacting me. So I started my first blog. I started soberaf.com not too long after like starting those videos. And I would just write blog posts about things I was going through, things that were difficult, just kind of different experiences. And you know, like some people would share them. It wasn't like worldwide blog or anything like that. But over time, I just kept having more and more people contacting me about it. And it really opened my eyes to like, how many other people in the world had an experience, even if it wasn't their own, maybe it was like someone in their family, someone they cared about that was struggling. And I actually had a dream one day that I found a book on the floor and I picked it up and like in the book was all pictures of me like wasted and the words in the book were my story. And I woke up and I was like, holy shit, am I supposed to write a book? Like, <laughs> cause I'm like so into like signs from the universe and things like that or God or whoever you believe in. And so after that, I was like, I literally went to my therapist and I was like, I had this dream and like, am I supposed to write a book or something? And, and she was like so supportive of it. And she basically said, she was like, you know, even if you didn't do anything with it, she was like, it might be a really good like experience for you to like write everything down and like journal it and help you kind of process things. And so by the time I did it and put that book out, like it changed my entire world. It changed my career. It changed everything for me. So it was, it was definitely not easy though. I'll say that it was, it was hard to put everything out so transparently because I knew people maybe that didn't know the extent of my drinking, were going to know everything and maybe we're going to judge me a little bit. But at the end of the day, it just ended up turning my life into this whole new thing and letting all these people into my journey and connecting with people that I never thought I would connect with like in my life. So kind of forging your own journey, it opened up all these new opportunities and what was what was kind of like the first time where you were like hey this because I'm, I'm sure like day one there was probably like that rush but was there ever like a moment one or two times where it was like you know what this is like a real thing yeah I like in the beginning obviously like all my friends and family were like ordering it and like supporting me like oh my god this is so great and I think like the first time that like sticks out in my head that it actually hit me was I had a woman contact me and tell me that she ordered the book and sent it to her son who was in rehab doing detox. And I was like, whoa, like, this is not my friend. Like, this is a random person who's sending it to someone that's actually going through this. And that was the first time I was kind of like, oh my God, like this is really going places. That's so cool. And to have like that kind of impact too, like I'm sure when you had first gone through the journey, you weren't really thinking this is going to impact a random guy in rehab who knows me from nobody. 
to have that kind of impact and that kind of reach, you know, that's one of just like the blessings of recovery and just going with it and just finding your own path. And not everybody has to be a one size fits all because I mean, I don't know a ton of people that have like written, but actually, I mean, because of the podcast, like I probably know more than most people, (laughs) but like, (laughs) but like in, in uh, like pre podcast, like I didn't know a ton of people that had written books. Like I I had a handful of people in my network that were published authors. It's like Hazelden and things like that, but not like, you know, on this just random, I had this idea that I was going to write a book. And I think that's just such a really, really great story and just so much impact. And so once, once you start getting momentum with that, like what's, what do your next steps look like? So I now have eight pieces on Amazon. Um, I've done half of them are sobriety. I also have uh, some of my stuff ge- is geared a little bit more towards like female empowerment, you know, inspiring women and all that. Um, but yeah, like at this point, I'm just like, oh my God, I just want to keep going and keep doing more. Cause every time I do something like more and more people find it and reach out and I've been able to create, I have four pieces on Amazon right now that are related to sobriety. So I have Sober as Fuck, I have Sober as Fuck the Workbook, which I created just because so many people were like contacting me and I was like, I need to give them something else. Um, and then I created Sober as Fuck, the daily sobriety tracker and journal because I love planners, journals, and I see so many people using like apps to keep accountability and to count how many days they have that I wanted to create something like physical that you could use on a daily basis to like keep in a part of your routine. So I made that and then I made the last one was 32 Badass Things About Being Sober, which is more of like a quick read type book because I know not everyone wants to read like a novel. So this one, it's short. It has like 32 things. Each thing has like a little blurb about it. Um, But yeah, it's crazy because every time I put one out, like more random people find it and they're like, oh my God, I'm going to order this now. I'm going to order this now. So I don't 100% know what's coming yet in the future for that, but it's just been really cool to kind of see it all coming together and see it reach people. And it makes me, you know, often play around with the idea of doing something in person, whether it's like locally or trying to bring together like a community of people. I do have um, a Facebook group called Slaying Sobriety that I run that has about 7,000 women in it. But it is, I always love that like in-person aspect too. So that's something I kind of always think about as well. Yeah, it's, it's almost like a backwards thing because most people will go in with, I do the, the one-on-one, do the one-on-one yeah. and then it's like, okay. And then I grow it and scale it. And then it's kind of like a grass is greener. Like, well, right. you know, I've got this gigantic audience, 7,000 women in my group, but you know, what if I start scaling down to like, little, (laughs) little things here and there. (laughs) No, I've, I've been through the exact same thing with, with, uh, my IT company where it was like, we, we had grown from like a hundred customers to like 10,000, like within a couple, it was like a couple months. It just like exploded. And then like, looking back once that explosion happened and it's like worldwide and like way, way, way more than I ever thought like anything could possibly happen with it. And I was like, you know, what if we open like a storefront? And it was like, so <laughs> it's like, if it's like, so we're already worldwide and then it's like, Oh, but we should like tone it down and like get a storefront to make like a couple grand here and there off of like right. break and fix jobs that we absolutely hate getting. It's like, no, 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 you, you're already winning. Like, don't, don't look backwards just yeah, because it's yeah. different. <laughs> but we have that, that addict mentality that what else could I do? What else could I do? Even if it's like a step yeah. backwards, it's like, well, but it's different. It's shiny. It's new. And then you probably get there and be like, you know what? I had such a gigantic impact, but at the same time, like those one-on-one things, mm-hmm. like there's no replacing human interaction and right. one-on-one. So it's not like a complete step in the backwards direction. It's just my brain always goes on like scale and growth and yes, all these that's, things. That's but the same. Like, I love that you said addict man- mentality because I feel like it's it's so funny. Like when I talk to people that are also sober, like we're all like that. It's like we're all in and we're doing it all or we're like not doing anything. Like there's no like middle ground. Like we just have that like intensity to us where we're like, oh no, I'm going to do this and this and this and this and this. Right. It's like, how many things are on Amazon? Eight. Right. Oh. In like two and, in and a half years. years. Like that's insane. Two and a half years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, you know, it's like, well, I mean, it, it really is. Like, I, I struggle with this just in general with entrepreneurship where it's like, I always put everything at a 10. So like, even though I'm almost seven years away from like a drink or drug, it's like, I still wake up at 3 a.m. Like literally, like as we are recording this, like I woke up at 3 a.m. and I was up for like 15 minutes and I was like, you know what I could do is get out of bed and start work really, really early today. Yeah. And then I was like, I was like kind of playing the tape and I was like, but then I'm going to be tired for like everything else in the day. And, and so, so I elected to go back to sleep. It was probably the smarter move, right? but it's like, it's at a 10, you know, I used to do yeah. that when I was drinking, it's like 3am and I wake up and it's like, you know what I could do? I could get drunk right now. Mm -hmm. I could start just because I find something that I like to do. And then instead of just casually enjoying it, I, I bring it to an 11. Yes. I either go super, super hard or I just don't, I don't do it. Or I'll be very, very into something for like a month or two. I think like the human, human beings in general are, are good for like three months of something, like whether it's diet, exercise, you know, whatever, whatever, like, the flavor of the quarter is, mm -hmm. but then we kind of lose steam unless it's something that like, at least for me that I get like really, really into. So like sobriety, like first three months, it was like, Oh my God, my life is so much better than it used yeah. to be. Like I'll put together another three months and then, you know, months turn to years turn to, you know, who knows what the future has. Like all I've got is right now, but mm -hmm. it's really cool how we have that like shared experience of, oh, I like entrepreneurship. I'm just going to put out a ton more books. Yeah. I like doing anything. It's like bring it to a 10 or just, just don't even play. But like normal humans, they actually, and I didn't even know this until sobriety, like normal humans could like drink one or two beers and like call it a night. Was that your experience? No, never. Um, yeah. Kind of like you said, I would literally like, I had to pregame everything. I was like a chronic, like way bad binger, but like I would pregame everything. I would drink while I was out. And then like, even after the bars would close at like 2 AM, like literally my girlfriends would wake up and she'd be like, there's empty a bottle of wine in my sink. Because like, I would get back and keep going when everyone else went to bed. And, like, but that's kind of like how you said it was like, you were at an 11, like 24 seven. Like it wasn't like, Oh, I'll have a glass of wine. It was like, Oh, I'm going to drink the whole bottle. Cause I'm blacked out already. Like, let's just keep going. <laughs> Right, right. And I, I think it's funny too when people are like, oh my God, like that person drinks a bottle of wine a day. And I'm like, that's it? Right. Yeah. Like when you're that's used four to and like a half. Copious amounts. And you're like, <laughs> wow, that was really bad, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah. It's like, oh, in a blackout, I drank another bottle of wine. And it right. just got me like unnecessary extra drunk that then were, were you the type that just blacked out all the time or were you, you able to hold it together? I was, I blacked out every time I drank like clockwork, Same. like every single time and it would be quick. And, but I never like passed out. I wasn't like a, Oh, she's going to black out and then be sloppy and like fall asleep somewhere. Like I was like full functioning blackout. So like I would literally like go places, talk to people and I would have zero like recollection. And people would say like, I talked to you for like five minutes. You didn't even seem that drunk. And I would not even know that I saw them. Like nothing, not even like a glimmer of seeing them. People would be like, oh yeah, we left and went to this after party. And I'm just like, what? Like, I don't remember any of this shit. So like, I think it almost made it even more dangerous for me because I would just keep going. Like there was no like, oh, I'm so drunk. I'm just going to fall asleep. I would just keep going and going and going and going and never hit a blackout where it like knocked me out. And so I would just, I was, oh my God, it was a hot ass mess to put it nicely. <laughs> so so if being sober as fuck is like an 11 on the sobriety scale, would you say that most nights were a drunk as fuck on the opposite end oh, of it? Oh, a thousand percent, yes. A thousand percent. <laughs> so what made you want to stop? So I actually, um, I had like a rock bottom moment. I know some people don't have those. Some people do. I was definitely someone that needed it because I was so in denial and didn't think I had a problem that I was like, no, everybody parties. It's fine. Um, 
So I actually went to a music festival in Detroit that happens every year. We went every year. It was fun. And I pre-gamed. I drank so much while we were in line. And then once we got into the festival, I kept drinking. And then I actually took a lethal combination of drugs from someone that I didn't know. I took like a handful of pills and I ended up collapsing on the concrete, like in the middle of this um, music festival. And so someone had to like run me out to a medic tent. And then I was actually taken to the emergency room by ambulance in downtown Detroit. And I like seized bit halfway through my tongue, almost went into cardiac arrest. Like it was like a very eye opening situation. Um, I ended up, I had such a high blood alcohol level. And then I had taken a combination of MDMA. I had taken ketamine, which is used in animal tranquilizers. Like it was just overload of everything. And when I got to the hospital, like when I finally like came to, I had no idea what had happened because I didn't even remember going into the festival. So I was like pulling IVs out of my arms. Like they had to like hold me down. And the doctors just basically told me like, I'm very small. I'm five feet tall. Like I'm a very tiny girl. And they were like, we don't even know how you pulled through this. Like your body was completely shutting down from everything you had taken. And they were like, somehow you pulled through this. Like, we don't even know. Like, like, do you realize what just happened? Like, and I think at the time I was so like out of it that like, I wasn't even like fully grasping the situation really. But once I like left the hospital and I think the first time it really hit me was when I like, I went to my mom's house. I didn't go home. I went to my mom's and my mom was like beside herself because like she was calling the hospital and they wouldn't tell her anything because someone had called her and told her I was there and they wouldn't give out any information. So they were like, she's here. And she was like, is she okay? Is she dead? And they were like, she's here. She's not, you know, we're doing that. Like, we just can't tell you over the phone, like what's going on legally. Like, So my mom's freaking out. My friends are freaking out. No one knows what's happening. And I think it like really hit me the next day. Like not only like, okay, I could not be here right now, but when I had to sit down and make phone calls and like send apology messages to people that were freaking out thinking I was dead was the shittiest moment of my life. Like I felt like such a complete piece of shit and a loser. And I was just like, oh my God, this is horrible. Like I don't ever want to put these people in this situation ever again. Yeah, I could see that uh, being a little bit of a motivation to to maybe yeah. put the plug in the jug. So were you, was it difficult in the beginning or were you just like, I'm never doing that again, like the end? I have literally never had a drop of alcohol since that night, ever. Like I've never, I went cold turkey and I was just like, I'm going to do this. Um, as I mentioned, like I'm very stubborn and hardheaded. So I was like, well, I'm just going to stop drinking. Like I'm just going to do it. Like no other option. Here I go. And I did it, but I will say I was so stubborn for the first year of it and opposed to getting help that I went through such horrible bouts of like depression where I didn't want to leave the house. And I lost a lot of people like friendships in my life, my family, I wouldn't see for a long time. And it was a really, really rough time for me, like mentally and emotionally, but I finally agreed to go to therapy um, right before I got to a year sober, which God bless. I don't know how I made it that long and didn't like fuck up or go back to drinking or something. But I finally started going to therapy a little bit before I hit a year. And that's when it all changed for me because I really started dealing with my stuff then and really started like figuring it out because like I was basically just like blindly stumbling through it for almost a year. And I was like, emotionally like hitting such lows and struggling so much just to get through it and feel like myself because I had lost such a part of who I was and who I had been for so long. Like it sucked. Like it sucked the first year, but I can say like once I finally opened up to accepting help and actually like wanting it, everything totally changed. Yeah. One of the, um, one of the men in my life, he always, he always comes back to saying like, when you surrender, Mm -hmm. that's when you win. And it's not giving up. It's just playing for the team that's already winning. Yes. It's not, it's not a failure. It's not like, you know, humans, we can, as much as our ego tells us, I got this. And I mean, I'm sure after like a year, you know, you're like, my life is terrible, but I mean, like you've figured it out for a year. Like that's a long time to not do something that was like a really big part of your life. So, I mean, there's a ton of people that they'll go 
you know, week, maybe that three months that we're talking about without doing it and white knuckling it. But like, you just didn't get those thoughts of like, maybe I could go back. Like maybe it wasn't as bad. Like what is, what are your brain telling you at that point? I definitely had a point before I got to a year, I had one or two like really unhealthy relationships happen during that year. And I mean, like I was in such a like low, unstable place that there are people I would have never gotten involved with now, but you know, there was a lot of manipulation, abuse, trauma, like it was just horrible. And one of them, I remember us having a conversation where we were literally, he was like, well, I think after a year you could probably have a drink. And I was like kind of going along with it thinking like, well, yeah, if I've gone this long, like I could totally like maybe like on a year that's how I'll celebrate it by like having a drink or something. And he was like, yeah, you could probably do that. Like you've been strong enough this long. Like you could probably be strong enough to just like have one and stop. And like when I think back now, I'm like, oh my God, like thank God I didn't listen to that person. And I eventually like opened my eyes and left them and like stopped thinking that way. But there were definitely times I played around with the idea of being like, well, if I went this long, and I was strong enough to do this, then I probably am strong enough to start drinking and just be normal again. But it just got to a point where I realized like, I'm probably never going to be one of those people that can do that. And I had to just accept that. It's tough though to accept it because you see other people doing it. It's not a problem for them. At the same time, that liability of being an alcoholic drug addict, I talk a lot about it, how you can turn that into an asset. You never would have gone down the journey that you've gone through you would just be kind of like train wreck AF girl if maybe yeah. that, that person probably exists. She, oh, for sure. Probably. I, it's probably I the people I used to hang out with. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If nothing else, that was, that was my, uh, I'm, I'm just Googling it real quick. Yeah. There, there isn't like someone, Ariana Grande uh, shows up twice. So maybe she's <laughs> a, uh, <laughs> Uh, she's got she's got a song about it. I, I see, oh, okay. but <laughs> but Sarah, it's been so great having you on the show. Where can people find you on social media and your uh, your book? Thank we'll you so much for listening to Self Made and Sober. Yeah, Be sure to join our Facebook Sarah group at facebook.com slash groups slash SMC Mastermind, um, like Self Made Coaching Mastermind. I hope you enjoyed the show and be sure to subscribe and rate the show so you can get notified each Friday when we put out a new episode. Please share it with your friends and family if you know someone who's struggling. I think that this episode is a great reminder that you can be in a really low spot and still come out on top. And Sarah, it was so great having you on the show. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me on.